Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to define exactly what we mean by the word diffusion. We're going to talk about the factors that affect diffusion, or the rate of it more specifically, the importance of the surface area to volume ratio when we think about diffusion, and we'll think of some real life biological examples both inside and outside of the body. So let's take this definition to start with that we've got here on the first screen. So we define diffusion as the passive random net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, typically through a partially permeable membrane. So let's talk about what those words actually mean. The passive. So what we mean by passive is, is that it uses no energy. We don't have to use any energy at all to make diffusion happen. So these particles that are going to move, they're not needing that kind of push. We're not having to actually use any ATP, unlike we do in active transport, which I talk about in another video. So this is a passive process. I've put random because it is random where these particles move to. They're not in a fixed path. They don't go from A to B and that. That's it. They can randomly move. And I've also put the word, or the word net movement, because we think of it as being a sort of like total movement of all the particles. So if there are some particles in one area in a high concentration, and then a few in a low area, low concentration, we don't imagine it's just one or two. We imagine it's a sort of like net process. That all of the particles eventually will start to move. When we say high concentration to low concentration, essentially that means from where there's a lot to where there's a little. And this term here, the partially permeable membrane, now that means a sort of membrane that allows certain things to go through and not others. So partially permeable, it lets a few things in but not others. And in the biological examples we're going to talk about, we'll see that there's always a partially permeable membrane that something is going to diffuse through, essentially. Okay, what I want to do is just draw a very quick sketch just to, to make or illustrate this point. Let's imagine we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, Ga random gas particles over on this left side and on the right hand side we have nothing. So on the left hand side there's many particles, they're in high concentration and over on the right there's none, so that's a very low clearly concentration. So these particles essentially would just diffuse, they just move across. And that's what we mean when we're saying they move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So one of these red circles would move across, then eventually another would move across, and another. And you keep going actually until the sides almost balance, until they kind of equilibrate. Now, once you end up with, say, five circles on the left, five on the right... It's not stationary. They don't then just remain still. Particles would still move around. But we reach a sort of a state of what's called dynamic equilibrium. And that's whereby the, the relative concentrations sort of remain consistent even with these particles moving. Now that term dynamic equilibrium is only something really you see at AS and A2, A level. But usually at GCSE and below, we just talk about diffusion as being the passive random net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, ultimately. Now let's talk about this guy here. This man that you see, many of you may not recognise, but his name is Adolf Fick. And he was a guy that works primarily trying to understand diffusion and the things that he thought would speed it up and he noticed a few things he noticed that the rate of diffusion so right up here the rate of 
he noticed the rate of diffusion was actually proportional to, and this is a symbol for proportional, was actually proportional to a few things. He noticed that one, the surface area was a factor. He said that if there's more surface area exposed, diffusion would speed up. Two, concentration gradient So he suggested that if there were more particles on one side than another, a big difference, and that's what a gradient means, a difference, a bigger difference between the number of particles, then diffusion would speed up. But he also said that diffusion distance, so the distance that those particles have to move, also is an important factor. And that actually, if you reduce the diffusion distance the rate of diffusion would go up. So he said that the things that speed up diffusion, or the rate of diffusion, would be increasing surface area, increasing concentration gradient, and reducing diffusion distance. Now I just want to very quickly draw a mini sketch, kind of, to sort of illustrate this point. Imagine, if we take actually the picture of the lady from the first slide, imagine that she were to have just a random bottom of perfume over here. Imagine she's got a roundup on perfume, and let's just pretend there's a wall here. And behind the wall are some people. A bit of a weird setup, but let's just pretend there's some people behind this wall, and the lady from the first slide has some perfume. See, my, my drawings are terrible, but hopefully this should prove the point. So if we apply fixed law, and that's the law that relates these three things that I've listed in black. He said that the surface area, if you increase it, you'd get more diffusion. So if we essentially were to shrink these walls and expose more physical surface, so expose more of the people, then diffusion would speed up. And that's true, because more of the people now, on the right side of the wall, can be exposed to the perfume. So we've kind of increased the surface area, the, the, the sort of availability of the surface of people for the perfume to come in contact with. Concentration gradient, well, we have a lot of perfume on the left, and no perfume beyond the wall over to the right. So the perfume particles, when sprayed, will naturally diffuse across. But if we were to make the perfume bottle bigger, if we increase the concentration of perfume that we spray, Fick said that diffusion would happen faster. There's an even bigger difference of lots of particles over here, perfume, and barely any, in fact none, over on the right-hand side. And finally, diffusion distance. So... What if we bring the girl closer and she sprays the perfume just here? Then that perfume would diffuse and come into contact with the people much faster. Now I know it's a very odd example, but it's just to highlight the importance of these three things to diffusion, surface area, concentration, gradient, diffusion, distance. And actually, we can apply this kind of principle to the real-life biological examples. Now, at GCSE, you don't often come across this. You do it at A-level. But we're just going to put at the bottom here a little something for fixed law. So I'm just going to write it in symbol. So he said the rate of diffusion was proportional to the surface area times the concentration gradient divided by diffusion distance. So ROD is rate of diffusion, SA is surface area, C is concentration gradient, D is diffusion distance. So you can see that a bigger surface area, 
would increase diffusion. A bigger concentration gradient, so a bigger value of C, would increase the rate of diffusion. And a smaller value of D, because we're dividing by a smaller value of D, would result in a bigger rate of diffusion. One question that often comes up when we think about diffusion is the, to do with the surface area to volume ratio. And I ask my students this question, which one of these two organisms, the tiger or the squirrel, would lose heat the quickest? And it's all to do with surface area in relation to volume. It's an important thing to consider when we look at diffusion. So let's just kind of work out which of these two creatures would lose the heat the quickest. And then we're going to talk about some real biological examples of diffusion. So imagine we have three cubes, like three dice. One of them is one by one on the side. One of them is a two by two on, its, on one side. And one cube on one side is three centimetres by three. So we've got three cubes, starting from the smallest, middle, and up to the biggest. So if we worked out the surface area, so the area of one side, and then times by six because it'd be a cube, for the one by one, that would come to six, because it'd be one by one for one area, and then we have six sides. For the two by two, that would be four, but then we have six sides, so that would come to 24. And for the three by three, 3 by 3 is 9, times by the 6 would be 54. So write those in. Let's imagine we work out the volume of each cube. That's the length times height times width. So the 1 by 1 by 1 cube ultimately would have a volume of 1. And it would look a bit like this if we just draw a mini sketch. And each dimension is 1. We'll just draw the diagram in. The 2 by 2 by 2, if you worked out the volume of that, so that would be 2 times 2 times 2, which would come to 8. And our diagram, again just for visual, essentially we have each dimension as being 2. And a 3 by 3 by 3, if we work out the volume, 3 by 3 is 9 times 3, would equal 27, would just for completeness sake, we'll just put a very diagram in where each dimension is three, just so we can see the size, relative size of the cubes. If we work out the surface area to volume ratio, we could say that this would give a ratio of six to one. Because what we want is to try and get per volume. We want to try and see how much surface area is exposed per volume? So we divide surface area by the volume. 24 by 8 would be almost the same as saying 3 to 1. So 24 divided by 8 is 3, that would be a 3 to 1. And this 54 to 27 would be a 2 to 1. So there are surface area to volume ratios. Let's think that what that means. So it says at the bottom, would diffusion be more effective when you have more surface area exposed for every unit of volume? So on our volume ratio, so this part here, they're all to one. So we're looking at a per volume, per centimetre cubed unit of that cube. And we can see that there is more surface area exposed on the smaller cube than there is on the bigger cube. So the 6 to 1 means that for every 1 volume, we have 6 lots of surface area exposed. And as Fick said, the bigger the surface area, the bigger the fusion, this would suggest that the smaller the cube, the easier diffusion can take place through it, and that's what you would find. Diffusion of things through this cube, for example, would happen much faster than in a larger cube. Equally, if we go back to that tiger and squirrel conundrum, which one would lose heat quickest? Well, the smaller of the creatures would be represented by the small cube, so the squirrel would lose heat quickest. Now, again, another silly sketch, just to kind of prove this point. If we take two faces, take a big face there, and we draw a little face here, 
If I were to draw the same size cube, or a, the same size sort of square, map out a square on both of these faces, if I just put one square there, then what you can see is that even though the red square is the same size, the same sort of, that's representing our one unit of volume, we have more face essentially exposed on this smaller picture than we do on the larger one. We have more of its surface area exposed in that red square than we do in this large. So again, that's just a very simple picture just to show you that the smaller the surface area to volume ratio, the less surface area exposed, the larger the surface area to volume ratio, the more you have exposed and it's important for diffusion because, as we said, the greater the surface area, the greater the rate of diffusion. Now, in part two of this video, so we're gonna, I'm going to split into two, we're going to look at four very classic examples of diffusion in biological systems.